More than any other region, Spanish America demonstrates the global ramifications of the Napoleonic Wars. Largely ignored in traditional narratives of the war, the crisis and collapse of Spain's empire and the Americas were direct results of the political turmoil in Europe. If the Eastern question revolved around the key question of the fate of the Ottoman Empire, there was a corresponding Western question, one that centered upon Spain and its imperial domains. During the Napoleonic Wars, this vast empire got fragmented and was henceforth relegated to the sidelines of world politics. The United States, of course, was not alone in its interest in Spanish America. Political and economic tumult in Spain and Portugal created unique circumstances for the extension of Russian influence in the Western Hemisphere. As early as May 1806, Count Nikolai Rumyantsev, the Russian Minister of Commerce, argued that Russia could easily procure colonial goods of the finest quality directly from the Americas, circumventing the services of the Hanseatic merchants and the money spent on, quote, the commissions and profits of the Hamburg merchants, as he put it. These could be used to promote domestic industry and expand the size of the Russian merchant marine. Over the next three years, the Russian government considered several proposals by the mercantile elite for expeditions to South America, with the goal of establishing Russian commercial presence there. These commercial ties faced a major obstacle. Russia remained part of the continental system that banned British goods from the continent. With Spain and Portugal in alliance with Britain, the Russian government would naturally have faced French questions about admitting Spanish or Portuguese vessels, potentially carrying British goods into its port. The Russian decision was simple but inspired. In December 1809, Rumyantsev informed his Portuguese counterpart that the government would ban any Portuguese ship from entering Russia, but would not extend this restriction to Brazilian vessels, as long as the Portuguese court would offer reciprocal treatment to Russian merchants in Brazil. This decision reflected the Emperor Tsar Alexander's desire to establish closer ties with Latin America. With Portugal and Spain in turmoil, he expected profound changes in the Americas, where as he observed in a letter to the Russian envoy to the United States, several independent states might soon be established. In discussing Russo-Brazilian ties at the State Council in January 1810, Rumyantsev pointed out that Russia faced a unique moment. The Tsar Alexander ultimately chose not to pursue ties with the Spanish colonies. He found the prospects of extending recognition to the insurgent colonial authorities unappealing and, more important, his priorities had changed with the start of the Franco-Russian War of 1812. For the next few years, Russia was preoccupied with the struggle over the future of Europe, devoting little, if any, attention to relations to the Spanish colonies. Nonetheless, the legacy of Russia's overtures to Latin America endured and would play an important role in later decades. That is from Alexander Mikabaritze's The Napoleonic Wars, which was published in 2020, I'm Joshua Trevino, and this is The Hard Country. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Hard Country podcast. My name is Melissa Ford. I'm a policy director at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I am joined by Joshua Trevino, our chief of intelligence and research. So thank you, Josh. That, I think that's one of my favorite monologues that you've ever read because it's so interesting. But since it's kind of long, can I ask you to summarize it briefly for our listeners? Sure. Uh, essentially, the you know what what Mika Baritze is getting at, uh, and it's a great book, by the way. Uh, so I read it when it came out in 2020. And anybody who's interested in uh, just the global history of the Napoleonic Wars must read it. He makes the argument, uh, which I found extremely compelling when I read it, that essentially Latin America, modern day Latin America, and, and by the way, Latin America did not exist as a concept back right. then. It only comes into Spanish currency. Spanish America. Right, yeah. precisely, in Portuguese America and so on. Uh, so it doesn't come into existence as a concept for another half century, and then it originates with the French. But Latin America at this point is on the threshold of crossing over on the world stage from being uh, essentially an appendage of Spain, part of the this global Spanish empire that had existed for the preceding 300 years, right. uh, into independence in all its varieties and forms. And Mika Britze is noting that this transition into independence uh, did two big things that he that he exposits in the passage. One is that it essentially removes Latin America from the world chessboard, mm -hmm. which I thought was a very interesting strategic point that he makes. Uh, but then it also becomes an object of interest for other powers. Traditionally, it had been an object of interest for Spain to a lesser extent, uh, the United Kingdom and certainly the United States being a Western Hemispheric power. But this idea, you know, going back to the 1810s, mm -hmm. that Russia is interested in Latin America, 
I think has a lot of resonance today. Yes, I definitely want to ask you about that. But there's a lot to unpack in this passage. And there's also not just historically, but there's a lot to in- interpret as well. Mm-hmm. But one of the first things that you said that I thought was super interesting is you talk about how the ramifications of the crisis that was happening in Europe, in Spain, in Portugal, was felt more in this Spanish America, right? Um, sure. More than anywhere else. Yeah. And what do you think the significance of, of that is? I, I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, it's, and it's interesting to think about the contention that it's felt more in, in Spanish America, that the Napoleonic Wars is felt more in Spanish America than anywhere else. Right. I think that's a, a debatable proposition to say the least. I think Central Germany and Russia and, you know, Spain proper would have something to say about that. But uh, I do think he's on firm ground uh, in as much as he has this argument yeah. that the Napoleonic Wars uh, caused more lasting change mm-hmm. in, in modern day Latin America than anywhere else. Uh, it's, it's the catalyst for independence, which uh, was likely not coming, or at least certainly not coming in the same form right. uh, in any other way. And so, so so that to me is terrifically interesting. And then what the sort of the strategic end state of that independence is, which is that Latin America essentially stops being sort of this global cockpit of history. Right. Not that history stops in Latin America, far from it. There's, uh, you know, and you and I have discussed on this podcast yeah. quite a bit of that very interesting history. But this idea that it's an engine of history that has ramifications in Europe and Asia and elsewhere sort of comes to an end uh, right. in the first two decades of the, ni- of the 19th century. And that, I think, is uh, quite an insight. Yeah, I agree. And you, you brought up Russia, so I'll piggyback off of that. But something that was really fascinating to me is that there was so much interest, right, in the Americas back then. It wasn't just Spain. It wasn't just Portugal. It wasn't just Europe. But it was very interesting to me that Russia had such a big interest in in the Americas. And and it didn't work out. It didn't pan out for them for, for a couple of different reasons. But this was fascinating to me. And this brings me back to something that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's the, the tweet. You know what tweet I'm talking about. I do about. know what tweet you're talking about, please. It yeah. was the, the tweet from the Russian embassy in Mexico. Yes. And in the tweet, I want to get this right. Um, it's very problematic, but it was um, a quote from Nikolai Petrushev. Yes. And he is the Secretario del Consejo de, de Seguridad, the, the secretary for, for the National Security Council, I guess. Sure. The Russian Security Council. Right. And the quote is, um, this is translated, so it might not be exact, but there is no question that sooner or later, America's neighbors to the south will rec- reclaim the territories that were stolen from them. The United States acquired the status of a great power through economic achievements based on cynical actions to seize territory, resources, exploit pueblos, uh, towns or uh, communities, peoples, yeah. and, and benefit from the war ills yes. um, of other states. So we read the first part of the quote uh, when we were in Mexico City, but I had not read the second part of this quote. Oh, yeah. So can I first get your initial reaction? There's almost an element of comedy to it. Uh, yeah. If anybody's going to criticize uh, other nations for historical expansion via war <laughs> and subversion in the whole nine yards, I mean, I mean, the Russians would know, right? And so, right. so it is, you know, it's 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 just proof positive right there. Um, but what's I think what's more proximately interesting is this idea that is something that they would raise now. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, and, and and let's divide historical Russian interest in the Americas from what's happening now. The historical Russian interest in the Americas, uh, which you know Mikhailidze is talking about in his book. Uh, uh, and which really continues all the way through uh, essentially the sale of Alaska in the late 1860s. 1867, I think it was. I don't remember the exact I date. I wouldn't know. Uh, let's say it was 1867, and someone on the internet can correct us if needed. Yeah, we'll look it up. But, uh, but uh, you, you know, Russia, Russia was a much more significant North Pacific power um, uh, really for about a century or so, I think, than is commonly recognized. And one of the reasons that uh, Alaska in particular ends up getting sold is because in the Crimean War, uh, it becomes uh, there's, a, there's a whole Pacific campaign in the the mm-hmm. misnamed Crimean War. And the British and the French have fleets and they fight in, the, I think, the Sea of Okhotsk. And there's um, some bombardment of um, Vladivostok, I think, or uh, in, in, in any case, it becomes evident to the Russians that they cannot effectively defend uh, this expansive territory. So rather than have it fall into British or French uh, rule, they sell it to the Americans, who's perceived at that time as sort of this 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 friendly, uh, quasi-neutral third power. This also caps off this decade in which uh, Russia and the United States have incredibly friendly relations. There's a great story, yeah. which we won't we won't get into here. It's but kind of surprising to think back on that. 
Uh, it is a little bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. Although, although you know, it, it's interesting that uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, in the 1830s actually predicted this that it would be Russia and the United States eventually who who, who rise to the fore mm. uh, among the nations just by virtue of sheer size and also um, sort of the differential quality of their their governing models. Right. One being very autocratic and monarchical, and the other being, right. uh, you know, conceived in liberty, uh, to borrow a phrase. Um, uh, but even during the Civil War, there's this very famous visit of the uh, the Russian fleet uh, to New York uh, that sort of lends this moral. Um, uh, boost to the Union cause uh, during the American Civil War. So anyway, so it's a very friendly relationship, uh, and you can still see the the traces of kind of the Russian epic and the Russian era mm -hmm. uh, on the North Pacific coast. You can see it in uh, you know Orthodox churches among um, uh, Native Alaskans. You can see it at places like Fort Ross in California. You can see it in a lot of uh, you know some of the smaller place names, uh, basically stretching in this chain from the Aleutians all the way through Northern California. So it's there uh, and it's real, and then it ends up disappearing. That's all qualitatively different because that was much more, um, uh, I would say, classic kind of mercantilist territorial expansion that characterized all the European powers of the time. What we see in the modern day uh, with, um, uh, say, you know, take Russian diplomatic activity in Latin America, right. you know, you mentioned Mexico, for example, um, uh, is something is something quite different. It's very uh, different. It's very different. Yeah. The Russians aren't doing it now because they want to have territory in, in Latin America or anything like that, influence for sure. Um, but it's sort of this old story uh, that emerges of, of, of third party powers, um, always in the other hemisphere, trying to leverage Mexico in particular, and to a lesser extent, other parts of Latin America as bases of operation against the United States. That's why, and this is a conversation you and I have many times in Mexico City. Right. Um, uh, apparently, the it's either the largest or the second largest um, Russian diplomatic uh, delegation is in Mexico. It might be the largest. It might be the largest yeah. in the world. It's it's disproportionately large. Yeah. I think you know, especially when you consider what Russia's actual you know like like proximate interests are. Mexico is not yeah. one of them. But as one of the Mexicans said to us. They're not doing it because they love Mexico. Uh, you know, they're not there and they're not engaging in these things and they're not tweeting things like this about the, right. you know, kind of the reclamation of lost Mexican territory because they're just they really empathize with Mexico. Of course not. Nothing to do with it. It's it's because Mexico can be instrumentalized and leveraged against the United States. And you know, whereas I think in previous eras there, there was sort of this this vaguely farcical quality to it uh, because the United States and Mexico did enjoy broadly good. I don't want to overstate this because there were plenty of uh, you know points of difference, but say like like date it from as late as you possibly can, say 1940, for example, set aside the kind of the difficulties and relations from the 20s through the 30s. From about 1940 through uh, I would say 2012-ish, the U.S. and Mexico had really good relations, and the Mexican uh, uh, kind of elite governing class, certainly the Mexican president. Presidents, the Mexican, uh, the SRE, um, uh, sorry for our listeners, uh, the, the foreign ministry, um, uh, should, uh, you know, you were sophisticated enough to understand that they just weren't up for being used in that way. The yeah. Germans tried to use Mexico in that way. There's obviously the famous example of the Zimmerman telegram. Yeah. There's also the German advisors who turned up at the Battle of Ambos Nogales, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we've talked about, I believe, on this podcast. Um, uh, but that kind of instrumentalization by a third party for, to, to use Mexico against the United States. Um, never ends well for Mexico. The French tried it as well, uh, yeah. and and the United States, from a strategic standpoint, ended up getting the upper hand in that. So, so, so this is not a, a new story that no. we see. It's yeah. not something that, uh, that that is new. What what is new in the modern age is that the president of Mexico himself and Mexican governance at large does not appear to possess the awareness or sophistication necessary to to ward it off, to disclaim it, uh, and to refuse to engage with it. And I think that's a problem. What do you think it is? Just out of curiosity, do you think there there's this quote about nothing makes two people clo as close as friends as having a common enemy or right. something like that? But do you think it's that or like why isn't Mexico threatened by how huge the Russian diplomatic mission is in Mexico, especially a president that is so, um, you know, he likes to set his foot down on, on his sovereignty and Mexican sovereignty. Do you think they should be concerned, threatened? Right, right. Uh, you have to understand the context uh, in which it comes. Uh, and so so AMLO talks a big game about sovereignty, right? And so this is sort yeah. of like the traditional Mexican nationalist line. Like, there's soberania, we've got to be con you know concerned with uh, sovereignty and resist outside powers and so on. Uh, but in, in, certainly in the case of AMLO and the Modernistas, it's not a consistent concern. Uh, the, the reality is that they're perfectly happy to surrender their sovereignty to a variety of actors. Just not the U.S. To cartels, right? To to, to the Cubans, uh, whom they import into the country, um, to a lot of the Foro de Sao Paulo uh, activists and strategists who um, are, are obviously informing Mexican governance. Um, 
Evo Morales, mm. uh, uh, another example. So, so it's not like there's this ironclad regard for sovereignty for its own sake. What it really is, uh, and we should call it what it is, is uh, less a prickly defense of Mexican sovereignty and more simply uh, antagonism toward the United States. And once we conceive of it in that vein, then it becomes possible to explain why they will be so very tolerant of this massive Russian presence uh, in Mexico. It's because of the motivations that underlie the critique and really the enmity yeah. uh, toward the US. Yeah. And one other thing that you said that I thought was really interesting, and I forget about it, right? That Russia and the U.S. used to have like decent diplomatic relations, and that what what Russia did with Alaska, just basically giving it to the U.S. Mm -hmm. To think back on that kind of blows my mind, because now, you know, the the big nations sometimes they are very territorial, and the U.S. has always been territorial, sure. and and we see it. I mean, we see it here. The U.S. Um, had some resentment towards the British in the monologue that you that you just read, mm -hmm. and they didn't want the British to extend their influence into the Spanish Americas, into the Americas. Right. And so the U.S. kind of always stood its ground, which I've thought you know has always been so interesting. And one thing that I want to discuss relating to that is I wanted to have our conversation that we had about the Monroe the Monroe Doctrine, um, which for the listeners that don't know, um, basically the Monroe Doctrine was like the U.S. policy um, towards the Western Hemisphere. And, mm -hmm. it, and it happened kind of in a funny way. It was brought up in the middle of like a not super important annual speech, right? Uh, but, but what happened in it is um, it was essentially a warning to Europe. Right. It was a warning right. to the European nations not to meddle and not to interfere with not just the U.S., but with the with the Western Hemisphere as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know what kind of feedback you've heard on it. Um, first of all, it, let's hear what kind of feedback that you've heard on it. The Monroe Doctrine, uh, I, I don't remember the year, 1818, something like um, that? Uh, 1823. 1823. Yeah. Okay, a little bit later than I uh, than, than than I realized. Yeah. So the Monroe Doctrine is is as you say was articulated uh, as an expression of really high level uh, American strategic policy, uh, excluding European powers from the Western Hemisphere, basically. Yeah. And it didn't signify that we would go and we would kick out uh, existing European powers. So, for example, the Monroe Doctrine is not followed up by any um, efforts to eject the British from Jamaica or the Spanish from Santo Domingo or anything like that. And so, and so it, it recognized in the time, contemporaneously, it recognized the existing state of affairs, but it also, it also effectively said, we're not going to allow a recolonization or a differential right. colonization of these newly independent Latin American republics. The Monroe Doctrine is also a, uh, a well-known mechanism for uh, American hegemony. Uh, mm. in the hemisphere, uh, yeah. or imperialism if you prefer. Uh, I, I personally don't care which you, word you use, because um, it's effectively the same. Um, but uh, you know, we had some conversations, you and I, about it in Mexico City. And as you might guess, the Monroe Doctrine is terrifically unpopular throughout Latin America. It's, it's, I don't think there's any place where it's, it's popular. I, there, there might be a Panamanian or two who, who recognize that it worked in their favor in 1903. Um, uh, but certainly in Mexico, uh, it's unpopular. Uh, d does it ever come up in Bolivia? I'm just kind of curious. No, uh, no, because because we never. It, it doesn't. But but I have heard that it that it is very unpopular. Yes, right. Yeah, well, right. It is. Uh, it is, and it's interesting um, uh, to think about the uh, the policies and the actions that unfolded under the aegis of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, everything from the intervention on uh, behalf of Venezuela versus the British in the latter half of the 19th century, um, uh, to, uh, 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 to aiding Juarez uh, versus the French, to a variety of um, uh, you know, the, the intervenciones that we've talked about, the mm -hmm. interventions in uh, places across the hemisphere. So you know, Cuba, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic, you, know, you can go on and on and on. Uh, about this, um, uh, the most recent invocation of the Monroe Doctrine probably was uh, somebody will correct me here, I'm sure, but it probably was in the 1983 invasion of the island of Grenada, uh, which is done, uh, you know, in conjunction with this Eastern Caribbean force and and the United States. Um, so there's a lot of. Sorry, go ahead. Did you have a question? No, no. I, I was just I was just thinking. I don't know exactly if the last time was with Grenada, but the Monroe the Monroe Doctrine is mm -hmm. is so interesting, right? Because initially, when when it was said by Monroe, some people even saw it as something positive, 
I don't know if I can speak for, you know, Central America. America. Or... Possibly, because I think when he first brought this up, it was seen as like solidarity with his mm-hmm. uh, newly, you know, independent republics of, of the Western Hemisphere. So it was seen maybe as something positive. But then I think when it started getting distorted was probably with Roosevelt, right? When he when he took this and, and kind of strengthened the language and used it as... Um, justifying the U.S. going into these other countries in the Western Western Hemisphere. And as a result of this, U.S. Marines were sent into Santo Domingo in 1904, right. Nicaragua in 1911, Haiti in 1915, um, basically to keep Europeans out. So what it was initially meant to do uh, was, was not to intervene necessarily in what was originally going on, but mostly a symbol of solidarity but when it, what it ended up being distorted or strengthened as was let's you know let's intervene and let's kick Europeans out. Let let me let, let me modify that though. Uh, I, I think I think there are plenty of examples of of actions taken under putative Monroe Doctrine grounds that actually did aim to exclude their you know foreign powers, third party mm. powers, the, you know extra extra hemispheric powers. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of these, including several of the examples that you name here, that uh, that really didn't have much to do with that. And so and so what you ended up seeing, uh, particularly after 1898, um, but not just then, was this application of the Monroe Doctrine and this idea of American regional hegemony. Um, that basically extended toward um, uh, this belief that the United States effectively had to, I'm going to oversimplify it, but effectively had to keep order in the region. And if there wasn't good governance in Haiti, or if there wasn't good governance in Honduras, then the United States would go ahead and impose good governance or what, you know, or what pass right. for good governance in those places. Um, there was also a much more aggressive willingness to defend American, uh, you know, candidly economic interests in a lot of these places, too. Mm-hmm. This is how we get the phrase banana republic, right? Because the mm-hmm. United Fruit Company, uh, you know, you know b- played played a uh, you know, kind of a motivating role uh, in a lot of these interventions. All of which I want to get to, and I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of defending uh, you know, everything that, that the United States did vis-a-vis Latin America, although I will argue that we were largely uh, a force for good, which is, which is a position contrary, I think, to what most of the academy and, and a lot of media would hold these days. Um, but the point that I was making uh, in Mexico City, and this is the point that I want to exposit here vis-a-vis the Monroe Doctrine, uh, is that, is that uh, exactly to what you were saying uh, earlier, you know, it was conceived in an era, an advanced in an era when there was a belief, and this belief evaporated really quick, that the United States and these new independent, formerly Spanish um, uh, republics mm-hmm. were basically sister republics of the Americas. That just as right. we had fought for our independence against the British, they'd done so against the Spanish toward the same end, and now we were all going to be new world republics together. Um, uh, but it was never true. The ideological basis for, uh, for, for independence for any of the Latin America republics was never that of uh, the United States for independence versus Britain. Right. Um, you know, George Washington and, and, and Simon Bolivar, uh, who mm-hmm. I, I assume is a big deal in Bolivia, mm-hmm. um, as you would assume from the name, um, but, but, but they're, not, they're not politically or you know, I would say morally the same uh, right. uh, in, in many ways. And that's not to disparage Bolivar, you know, because he's a historical figure and we owe him the charity of, right. of being contemporaneous, but, but they fought for fundamentally different things. And they had fundamentally different visions as to the end that their revolutions went to. And so when you get this 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 kind of divergence and this understanding that you know formerly Spanish America and the young American Republic in the United States uh, are not traveling on the same path, then I think the application of the Monroe Doctrine starts to change. Yeah. But I will argue this, and then I'll stop talking because I know you have <laughs> a lot of other questions. Uh, I, I, I would argue strenuously, and we did argue this in Mexico City, that the existence of the Monroe Doctrine, however flawed it may have been, however erratic the application, was probably the singular reason that Latin America did not suffer the fate during the late stage era of colonization, of European colonization, that uh, that Africa, South Asia, and East Asia ended up suffering. You know, because there were modern, you know, more modern-ish independent polities in many of those places as well. Um, but but the overwhelming majority of them end up getting swallowed up um, uh, again by late stage European colonization. And what the French tried in Mexico which was only possible in the context of the U.S. Civil War, my guess is that that would have been tried over and over and over again by a variety of European powers absent that American hegemony. And that, I think, is something that certainly our friends in Latin America, from a historical perspective, ought to keep in mind, except for the sake of argument, every critique that they may have of the United States and its actions, and there are plenty of legitimate ones, um, uh, I suspect it still is better than having the Belgians come around. Well, I just I want to say one last thing about that. Please. And I know the the Monroe Doctrine didn't really affect us in Bolivia. I have heard 
people that hate it. <laughs> I've heard yeah, that a lot. Yeah. Um, they think it's a, an example of like the U.S.'s arrogance or high handedness. Um, but the one thing that I want to say, being from Latin America, I can't speak for everyone from Latin America, sure. is that in general, I think we are not un-American or anti-American at all. I think the, the opposite is actually true. I think that most people have a very favorable and positive view of the United States in Latin America. And in fact, I read something really interesting the other day that says that where the U.S. has had most intervention and maybe even dramatic intervention is where the U.S. It is actually most favorably viewed, like the Dominican Republic That's or like Guatemala or Nicaragua. Yeah, these were polls, which I thought was very fascinating. Is this is this Pew Research or what did you, what, what did you say? I need to look. It was in an article and, okay. it, and it was referenced as like um, some of the people in Dominican Republic were saying that they have such a positive view of the U.S., right? Okay. Same goes for like El, Salv El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, um, where the U.S. has had like a big hand and they view the U.S. favorably. And so I just think that's important to put out there. Okay. Um, but I know we spent a lot of time kind of dissecting no. Can't spend too your much time on monologue. This. Yeah. It might be a record, but there's a lot of other things that I want to talk about. Um, maybe some more current events. And we Please. could start with something juicy, which is that AMLO has been recently blaming the DA lately, which is no surprise. President AMLO, what is he blaming the DA for? Well, there's a few different things. Um, first of all, he is blaming the U.S. with no proof, by the way. Uh, for hacking into uh, the Mexican Defense Ministry's email, right. um, which revealed a lot of interesting information. Uh, one of the interesting things that it revealed was that their defense minister was taking some very luxurious trips with his family um, and paying for them with public funds. I mean, yes, Milan, Rome, um, Florence, Moscow, uh, just a, a ton of places. And he wasn't just taking like his wife, mind you. He was taking like the extended family, um, like 10 people in his security details, staying at the nicest hotels, mm. um, taking, by the way, like military planes and commercial planes, first class, um, most expensive restaurants, so much shopping. I think I wrote down, okay, recent estimates suggest he spent about 2.5 million pesos. So I don't want to get too off track, but can you imagine, I mean, the outrage if a U.S. official that served in public service did something like that? I mean, it's it, it, it's insane. It depends but, on the context. I think, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's certainly... There certainly is a phenomenon of the uh, the well-heeled junket, uh, even in the United States government. Yeah. I think what's extraordinary about this episode is less that the um, who is it the the minister for Sedena is that uh, is yeah that who's doing yeah it? Okay. his name's Luis Crescencio Sandoval the Sandoval, defense minister Sandoval yeah. okay so 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 Sandoval's got expensive uh, he's got expensive tastes and he likes to travel in style and bring his family with him at least he's a family guy though so oh, give him yeah. that yeah, yeah right, that's probably go. why Amlo when he was questioned about it you know what he said uh, he no. said ¿Cuál es el problema <laughs> oh, because he brought his family with him. That's well, the, uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Well, but. you know, it's it's uh, the the extraordinary element to me, of course, is is the fact that he blames the DEA. Is this part of the Guacamaya leaks? Yes, it is. Yes. So, so, so we should tell the listeners uh, to remind them what the Guacamaya leaks are. It's a hacker collective that has uh, gotten this incredible trove of Mexican government um, data, not just Mexico, but you know, predominantly yeah. in Mexico, Mexican government data. And so, I guess they're just sifting through these terabytes of data, and stuff is coming out uh, as they go. But apparently. It's the Drug Enforcement Administration that's doing it, right? Because yeah. that's, that's Amlo's villain. Well, and it, that's one thing he was also fuming about. He was fuming that he didn't know that the DEA was undercover investigating the Chapitos, which yes. isn't that the point? Yes. But for our listeners that don't know, the Chapitos are the sons of the, the very famous Mexican drug lord, El Chapo. Right. And when he went to prison... One of the times he went to prison, they basically took over and they were running the Sinaloa cartel. And um, I guess he is accusing now the DEA of being involved with that. And he is also accusing us of, I guess, not not being organized because he didn't he didn't know about it or he's, he's outraged that the uh, Americans would surveil the Sinaloan cartel. 
How dare, how dare we? How dare we? Well, uh, I mean, but this goes back to what's out in the open, which is that the president of Mexico has an alliance with the Sinaloan cartel. Yeah. There's a reason he defends them. Uh, and it gets back to kind of our, our discussion of selective sovereignty uh, in this yeah. case. Um, uh, the Sinaloan cartel pushes out the formal organs of the Mexican state. They have gun right. battles with the Mexican army. Uh, they kill Mexican soldiers. But the president of Mexico will stick up for them, especially of versus course. the Americans. Yeah. And, and, and it tells you a lot about his priorities and where his alliances are. Um, uh, yeah, I, we obviously are uh, surveilling the scene loans, and I would yeah. hope that our law enforcement and intelligence agencies were doing exactly that. Uh, if I had to guess, I would um, advance a suspicion that one of the reasons that AMLO is upset about this news is that he knows that somebody in the sprawling Mexican state apparatus is cooperating with the Americans mm. and has kept the president out of the loop. Yeah. And I think that is alarming him a great deal, as yeah. well as should. Yeah, 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 I think it is. He he also said that it shows how, I guess, disorganized we are here, because when Cienfuegos was imprisoned, Trump didn't know about it. Mm. So yeah. that's just yeah. a, a that's another random... Te- that's another tell on Amlo's yeah. part, uh, which tells you, of course, he's totally unconcerned with who's informing Trump. But what that does is that, sig- that signals to us, the listeners, that he is uh, alarmed that somebody's not telling the president himself. Uh, And that is a cause Mm -hmm. for great worry. Because uh, look, as we've been told uh, several times by Mexicans, if you pull on the thread hard enough, that alliance um, that the president of Mexico has with the Sinaloan cartel is going to be laid bare for all to see. I mean, basically is already if you're paying attention, but it's gonna be undeniable and overt. And who knows what happens then? Yeah. Um, But that's not something he wants. No, it's not. And since we're on the topic of AMLO, I, I want to bring up um, a really interesting article that you and I already talked about this mm-hmm. week. Um, but it, it's this article that talks about AMLO's conservative leftism, which oh, is yes. so interesting. Yes. And I, I still struggle to say it because it sounds like such a paradox. Right. But it talks about how he has managed to be a leftist. I mean, he's a socialist. There's no question about it, right? But he still is conservative. Um, socially, right? Personally, Cause, personally, yes. personally, because he's you know he's a, a devout Catholic. He thinks that the family is the most important institution in in all of Mexico. Right. He's uh he's lashed out. He's attacked many times feminists because he say they are the big. He says they're the biggest threat to the most important institution in Mexico, which is the family. Yeah. And he thinks that they're a threat to that institution, and and not just that, but you know he's attacked. The, the trans movement. He thinks that men are men, women are women. Um, and he's even anti-green, which is honestly kind of funny. Yeah, um, some ways, yeah. Because he believes in, in, in them being independent, right? And he's, it's it's just, it, it really is a paradox. And I think this sort of ideological formation is so unheard of here in the U.S., so it's like very, very difficult for me to process. Um, But this article talks about that, right? And this article comes out and people are kind of, I feel like, praising him a little bit because he's managed to be conservative and, and Catholic and hold those beliefs personally. But at the same time, he's like a trendsetter because he's a socialist and he believes that right. the government needs to take care of its people. He supports unions, like all of these things, which honestly, it's very difficult to wrap my head around it. And so I wanted to ask you, there was there was an article by The Spectator, which kind of responds to this to this first article. The Spectator U.S. The Spectator U.S. Yeah. So can right. you can you tell us a little bit about what that one says? Well, uh, basically the same things that I think anybody who was informed about Mexico would say that it's 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 very easy. Uh, and, and by the way, the Compact Magazine article on Amlo's conservative leftism is by uh, Sorab Amari, who is one of mm-hmm. the founders of Compact. Um, uh, so you know, you know, and, and, and he his this is extraneous to kind of the, the thematic matter of our podcast, but just for context here, he's sort of on this long term quest to find um, you know, in his words, conservative leftists. So people right. who are basically socially conservative but believe in essentially essentially in a, an expansive role for the state. Which j- just to be clear, I'm, since I'm about to criticize the article very heavily, uh, I, I have a lot of sympathy for. Um, uh, you know, you know, I am I am certainly among the conservatives who think that we need to take a look at when the prudential use of state power is warranted. That being said, um, we also have to exercise basic discernment uh, and basic awareness when we right. evaluate figures, especially 
like Andres Manuel López Obrador, uh, who, um, you know, you know, for all his, his noises about loving the family and being personally conservative, and, and apparently he's pro-life, which is good for him. Um, but the question we have to ask is, does that actually matter in his governance? And the answer is no. Uh, no. You, know, you know, you look at, um, you know, pick your social justice cause, the transgender agenda, for example, uh, you know, go to Mexico City and, and see for yourself. Morena controlled governance under AMLO um, uh, ensures that every single government building, top to bottom, is decked out in uh, transgender flags and insignia for, you know, for, for, for Pride Month. Um, uh, you know, you can see it in a lot of the national school curricula that you and oh, I yeah. got to talk about yeah. uh, in, in Mexico, where children who are extremely young are exposed to uh, LGBT, yeah. QIA plus, did They're I get that right? Uh, agenda. Yeah. yeah, or right, or brainwashed. And so the fact that he is, is, you know, maybe personally conservative, and I think that's probably true. I think he actually, you know, out of charity, probably legitimately is pro-life. Um, but it sort of has the same value as, you know, Joe Biden's Catholicism. I mean, it may be a personal value that you hold, I don't know, but it means nothing as far as your governance goes. The reality is that AMLO's governance uh, is the complete opposite of anything uh, that would, you know, kind of attach itself to the phrase traditional yeah. values. It's super violent. By the way, you mentioned that he's against uh, feminists. Oh, yeah. Which is true, but we also have to understand the context for that. Uh, and this is something that I think the, that the, 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 the fellow at Compact you know, probably should have done a little bit of digging on. Uh, it's not that AMLO is, is personally opposed to anything that the Mexican feminists represent. Uh, the reality is that he hates them uh, because he hates anybody who criticizes him. And in this particular case, there's a mm -hmm. critical mass of Mexican feminists who have pointed out accurately that his administration since December 2018 mm -hmm. has been an absolute disaster for Mexican women who are getting killed, murdered, and raped in larger numbers than ever they're before. they're not doing anything. And they're not doing anything about it effective at the state because we have this abrazos, nabarazos policy um, that pertains. And so the feminists, of course, are criticizing him. And it's, That's you know, fair, as yeah. far as, uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, as somebody who, like, again, I'm not, am I personally sympathetic to, like, professional feminism? feminism? Uh, not really. But uh, do I think it's fair to complain if women are being killed in large numbers? 100%. And that's something that the Mexican president can't seem to bring himself to because his ego is too large mm. uh, to to accommodate any kind of critique like that. That's why he attacks feminists in Mexico. It has nothing to do with any kind of ideological opposition to the content of their agenda or anything like mm. that. We've, we've got to understand that. The consistent through line in the singular pole of Mexican governance right now is the accretion of power to the Morena coalition that's helmed by the president in alliance with the cartels that are its helpers and handmaidens. And that is the bottom of line truth on him, no matter what he personally believes. Hmm. That's so good. Thank you, Josh. And um, one one more thing that I want to talk about, just mm -hmm. because I know it's on our minds right now with everything that's happening in the U.S. House, um, the U.S. Senate, uh, right here, the Texas legislature. I know it's been on our mind. I mean, we've I testified twice this week. You testified last week. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's there's all these bills talking about the situation at the border. And um, I kind of wanted to, to end uh, talking about that because there's so many calls from both sides everywhere just continuing to call on the federal government to fulfill its duty of protecting American citizens and protecting our border, which is its, right. its main job. And they're not doing it. And, and what they're doing instead is the federal government is kind of pushing back saying, well, it's coming through points of end or through ports of entry. And and then there's just been this this big shift. We've talked about this, but in the past couple of months, it used to be kind of unheard of mm -hmm. for so many people to talk about like American interventionism. But now it's become really common. Yeah. Even presidential candidates, Nikki Haley, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who we talked about before in this podcast. Right. They're saying that one of the first things that they would do if they get elected is they would unleash the full force of the military into Mexico. Right. So this is something that's become really common to talk about. It was it was something that we talked about because it was in an article this week in the Deseret News where where you're mentioned. So I just wanted to pick pick your brain a little bit on maybe where this is going. Right. Um, just because it's we, we can't ignore it anymore. And so what do you think the future of all of this is? Yeah, no, great question. I, you know, I I would be uh, lying if I said I knew where it was going. I can, t I can tell you where I think it is headed uh, now, and who knows where, where the end state will be. Uh, there's a lot of policy options on the U.S. side, Texas side, uh, and, and certainly Washington, D.C., that right. are on the table now that were not on the table previously. 
uh, you know, two of the big ones I would say are foreign terror designations for Mexican cartels, right. and then state invasion declaration under Article One, Section Ten. And so here at the foundation, we've done research on both. Um, we're actually in favor of both um, uh, for, for for related but nevertheless distinct reasons. Um, the bottom line is that is that whether it's an invasion declaration by the state or foreign terror designation by the federal government, or even an authorization for use of military force in Mexico. Mm. Um, what really needs to happen is that the paradigm that has governed U.S.-Mexico relations uh, for the past generation needs to break. And breaking that uh, is, 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 it really is job one, because without that, you don't get to good policy that you need in anything else. And so that's something that we've been watching uh, both in D.C., here during the current Texas legislative session. I will tell you this, you know, with all the bills that, uh, that you've spoken on, that I've spoken on, uh, that our colleagues have spoken on, vis-a-vis -vis the border and border security, HB 20, creating a border protection unit, SB right. 1884, which creates a, basically a state felony for crossing the border illegally, um, uh, uh, you know, HB 1600, which, which, which does the same. It's the House counterpart to it. Um, uh, what am I missing? Uh, there's another big one that I'm. Uh, what's the what's the the one I just the elite the elite um, accountability S one SB 1884. That's 1884. Mm -hmm. 2424 is the one that creates a felony. I apologize, yes. I misnamed that. So okay. 1884 actually is the one which is uh, which imposes accountability Correct. upon Mexican elites. Yeah. Um, all of these things together are transformative bills. Right. Uh, and who knows? I mean, we're obviously doing our best at the foundation to, you know, you know, to urge their passage and support them in constructive ways. Um, ultimately, that's a choice up to the lawmakers themselves. But I can say this, the mere fact that they're being considered, the fact that many of them, including today, have been voted out of committee, and they're going to go to a full floor vote at yeah. some point, is is amazing. Yeah. It signifies a new era and a new willingness to step up and do what's necessary to be done yeah. uh, by the government of Texas for the people of Texas. Yeah. And uh, I can only hope that the government of the United States will do the same for the people of the United States at some point. Right. Not because uh, we wish to be inimical to Mexico, far from it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I would argue in many ways that uh, we, especially in Texas, are Mexico's best friend, but because the state cartel nexus that controls Mexico has made its choices in the exact opposite direction. Yeah. So we're compelled to act. Yeah, and how, how could we not, right? I mean, there's, right. No, there's no question that the cartels every single week are escalating in violence. There is headlines every day that are scary. Um, I saw that this week, I think uh, these armed cartel gunmen mm -hmm. entered a resort um, in Guanajuato and mm -hmm. killed six adults, one child. You're oh. hearing stories like this every week, Josh. I hear news stories like this every week. And the, the fact of the matter is that it's not just the cartels. Like, the cartels aren't this, like, individual criminal group. Mm -hmm. And this is something I testified on this morning when I was talking about the invasion. They're not just, like, a non-state power, like a little criminal conspiracy. They're a state power, too. And there was a quote in this article that we've been talking about that I wanted to share before we wrap up. Um, it's from Jeffrey Atticott. Um, he's like a retired lieutenant cur colonel and, and a professor as well. But he said that we might be better to view them, the cartels, as mm -hmm. virtual states rather than criminal drug organizations yeah. because they have all of the attributes of a nation state. Of course they do. And they have an armed force. They have a taxing system. There's so much collusion between them and the Mexican government that you can't even tell them apart. Right. And so they're they're not just criminal groups anymore. And that's something I want to continue to make sure that everybody understands, because when we talk about this term invasion, so many people think that we're saying, oh, we're being invaded by immigrants, which is not the case at all. We're talking about an invasion rightfully because it's an invasion by the Mexican cartels who are in a partnership with the Mexican government. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Uh, the, the, the definition of invasion does not require a formal sovereign state. Um, you can have you can have uh, organizations with the qualities of sovereignty attached to it, right. who can also be invaders, and that's something that our research uh, sets forth very clearly. And I'm glad I'm glad you bring that up because it's important to understand for policymakers in particular as they go through a lot of these responses, uh, just to know that um, uh, uh, that there's an array of actors to which we can respond. Right. Vis -vis and and I, I didn't mean to open that can of worms. No, I know that's, that's okay. part of a much, much larger, larger conversation when it comes to invasion, because it's something we've studied so yeah. extensively, right. right? So that will be for a different episode of the podcast. Um, Certainly. A story for a different time. <laughs> but thank you, Josh, as always. And thank you to all of our listeners for listening to The Hard Country. We'll see you next time. Time.